You may know Jeff Morrow as the funny guy on the Food Network's The Kitchen, or before that as the winner of the Network's Talent Contest, which led to his show The Sandwich King. But you may not know about his earlier career in Chicago's improv scene, including one memorable performance of the comedy Tony and Tina's Wedding, where a ticket holder died. The, half the audience leaves. I mean, they high it. They're like, we, we did not sign up for this. And the other ones are like, we signed up for this. The half of them didn't believe that this really happened. So now we have to, like, even after the body back, I mean, the guy's... You can't breathe in a body. I, mean, I don't know. I think they're pretty airtight. <laughs> so. I'm Charlie Myerson, and this is the Chicago Public Square Wednesday Journal Conversations podcast. Jeff Morrow and I sat down at Dominican University, not far from his alma mater, Oak Park and River Forest High School, or OPRF, as he calls it in the interview you're about to hear, to talk about that unforgettable experience and his career on stage, screen, and in the food biz. Also, his bathing habits. And he even sang a few songs at the end. Here's how it went May 15th, 2018, when Jeff Morrow and I took the stage in his old and his now again hometown of River Forest, Illinois. We filled this joint. That's nice. That's not bad, right? Thank Um, you, guys. Hi. It's up front row. I want (laughs) to... Mary. You know, I want to thank you, first of all, Jeff, because you were promoting this event on WGN Radio earlier this week, and you referred to me... As an international legend. <laughs> do, I, do, do you have a problem with that? I, I don't know where you got it, but I'm now putting it on my resume. So thank you very much for that. You know, my goal is to get as many people here as possible, obviously, just to hear the story and hear, hear you. you. You are. You know, I, I, I listened to your other uh, discussions you had with particularly uh, David Axelrod, and it was, you know, you're very insightful and you're very articulate and everything. And, and most of the time I'm doing three-minute interviews on, you know, zany radio shows where we don't get to the bottom of anything and there's really no discussion. So it's great to be a part of this, especially as the easiest commute I've ever had for a job, ever. (laughs) Of course, besides the traffic on Thatcher because they closed First Avenue at the tracks. So now everybody is going through my, you know, it's unbelievable. So it took me an extra 35 seconds. All right, so now you're not on the Zany Morning Show. No. You can stretch. Mm -hmm. People heard the short version, but I want to hear the personal epic tale (laughs) of how you became famous. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so I started, man, where should I start? Like, my family's here to cross-reference me if I make a mistake. (laughs) Um, You know, I guess it started in third grade, I would say. Believe it or not, that's when it all started, and that's when I kind of had, had this seed planted in me, and I was at Lincoln Elementary School here in Riverford. All right, some alumni here? All right. Any of my teachers here? No? Um, uh, so I, I did a, they did a school play back then where, where all the classes participated, and I, I auditioned for it. It was called Let George Do It. And I, was, I can't believe I remember, I remember half my lines. So I, and I auditioned for it, and I, I got the role of King George II, I believe. Is that correct, the third? I'm not a historian, I'm a performer, and I'm, I'm, a show, I'm in show business. I'm not in, see, now I get nervous because we're at a university here, and I have to be smart. <laughs> I try to put patches on my denim jacket, it just didn't stick. So I did uh, Let George Do It, and I remember... Uh, you know, our, first, our opening day, it wasn't even opening night, it was probably, a, you know, an afternoon performance, and we, uh, my parents came, and my dad was, you know, had his office was on Taylor Street, so we had to, you know, probably begrudgingly get in the car, battle traffic to come to this play, and my mom was there, and I, I came out on stage, and it was, I don't know, if they had no inkling that I had any, uh, uh, you know, uh, penchant for performance, but I... Came out on stage, and I, God knows where it came from. I think I know where the, the accent came from, but I came up, and I was like, Stop this nonsense! This instant I say! And I was like, I am King George III! And, 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 and here are my parents, like, I wasn't an athlete, you know? I mean, I could throw a ball, but I, you know, I wasn't like, I wasn't even the first ten picked in any sport. And here I was on stage with this, accent in this performance in this you know hand-me-down cape and everything and from that moment on my parents were like forget it you're involved in perform the performing arts so i started doing like second city youth programs wait they wait, would wait drive me around so everywhere we haven't heard about fourth grade yet fourth grade <laughs> you know 
sophomore effort. It was the down period. It was the dark period. I got involved. It was. It was all. It all happened so fast after third grade that, you know. Right. So <laughs> it's a typical sure. story, right? Well, skip fourth, fifth, sixth. Uh, what grade are we in now? I don't know. We're, we're we're probably college, and I graduate college. But I always, you know, they always they facilitated this this you know this seed, and it, and it grew and grew. And I this is at Bradley University. At Bradley University, I was I went to Oak, you know I went to Roosevelt and then Oak Park, uh, OPRF, where I remember being at Oak Park. I did plays there, uh, you know, uh, Studio 200, right, that was called, and main stage, but everything I could. I constantly performed while doing Circle Theater in Forest Park, if anybody remembers that. It was a little, all right, that's a good one. Uh, I loved it. I was, I, 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 and, and like, that was like, a, you know, my social avenue too, but I also hung out with people. I was everywhere, but I always had theater, you know, as my hobby, if you will. And then I, I remember being at Oak Park every year, and we'd hang for some reason by the pay phones at the front entrance of the school, trying to make free calls by putting a tack into the receiver. With, anybody remember that? Does is that just date me, like, unbelievably? I remember when the pay phones, when you can't make free calls by putting a thumbtack in there. <laughs> That's what it was. But I swear, it sounds so you know, juvenile and delinquent, but it was both. And, but right there by the payphones was, you know, the, the, the wall of fame for, you know, the, uh, and I was like, you know, when I saw these people, you know, Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio from the Abyss and Scarface, Ray Kroc and other, you know, you know, pretty talented people. I was like, I want to get up there. You know, I just want to be up there. So that was always like in the back of my head, you know, because I, I loved OPRF for what it taught me as, as a person. You know, it, 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 it's, it's a really big school and it's so diverse and so magnetic and, and, and kinetic and everything. It's like, it was like the worst week of my life was my freshman year there. And I was like, I had to sink or swim and it taught me to be, you know, be a, a real person. I think it prepares you for the real world. And I understand you were fussy about your lunches when yeah, that was probably before way school. before that. Yeah, I, my mom, I'm one of four kids, and, uh, you know, it got to a point where my mom was like, I'm done. I'm not, if you don't like your lunch, you make it your damn self. Maybe there was a dam in there. Maybe it wasn't. But in my mind, it's a better story if there's a dam. And so I would pack my own lunches, but I figured, like, why put it all to, you know, why smush the bread? Because right when you pack a lunch... Right, you put the thing, the lettuce and the cheese and the meat and the bread and the, the mayonnaise or the mustard, and it, it, by the time it sits in a locker for four hours, it turns into like a, a culture, like a, a, an experiment. So, so what I did was like, ah, I got you, mom. You know, fine. I'm gonna show you. I started separating all the ingredients in its own. We, we went through Ziploc bags, like they were like. <laughs> Like toilet paper, I was constant, right? And so I had the turkey from the cheese, separate from the, the, the lettuce. And, I, and this carried on to when I was like an adult working in offices. People would be like, what is this guy doing? And I would <laughs> assemble the sandwich, but I wouldn't put the bread in a plastic because I could s- taste the plastic on the... That would get foil. You and I have something in common, I understand. And, and in my case, it drives my family nuts. Yeah. A very acute sense of smell. Yeah. How has that helped you? How has that hurt you? It's a great question, because smell is directly related to, to taste, right? You can't smell and not, you know, you cannot not smell without tasting. So I would say that, like, I'll walk in somewhere... And immediately, if I smell like fry, like something intense like that, especially if it's carpeted, you know, like an Irish pub, but maybe in or around Madison Street. <laughs> like, I can't eat at a majority of these places because you walk in and you like, it's like the beer and the sweat and the fry oil is embedded in it. And it immediately turns me off. I, my wife will spend $38 on a candle from like Fitzgerald's or something over there. I'm just shouting out everybody today. <laughs> You know what I mean? But they have very expensive glass candles. This is not a Yankee candle, my friend. This is like artisanal. And if she'll light it and I'll come home, I'll be like, get rid of this candle. It's, it's giving me a, a headache. So it really does. I'm, I'm, it's funny. It's, I'm very, I'm very, I have a very acute sense of smell. 
it's led you to a career, or at least contributed to your career in food, whereas it's, it's turned me into a, I'm not a food, I am food impaired. Yeah, we, we were talking about that. You, you're, you're like, I get it, you know, because I was on WGN talking about sandwich slippage and about proper placement of a condiment or uh, a schmear. And, right, if you put the tomatoes against the mayonnaise, you take a bite, it's, it's awful, it's a horrible wreck. And he's like, I get what you say. You know, Charlie's like, I get it, because when I put the ketchup on the top and bottom bun, I was like, the issue is not the top and bottom bun placement. It's that you're, what are you putting ketchup on? <laughs> you know, you animal. I thought this was off the record. <laughs> I, did, I didn't know it was going to happen here. <laughs> um, um, so how I became famous, if you want to go back yeah, to that. Yeah, that's still I opened it, Okay. <laughs> First of all, it, for me, it was never about the fame. I did a podcast for my, my son's grade at Lincoln, a third grade podcast. It's available online. I'll, I'll put it out there tomorrow for, just to remind everybody. It's really cute. And they interview every question that the 50 kids in all th combined classes asked me was about fame. Like, everything. It wasn't about, I mean, third grade, right? And I don't know if in third grade I had as much of a knowledge or relationship with fame, right? I think now with the internet and YouTube especially and these kids look at these devices, it's like, how did you become famous? What's it like to be, be famous? What's it like to go places when you're famous? What's it like to travel when you're famous? And I'm like, and right, I, I'm I, like just, hold on, home. I have to cross all these questions off my list. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, it was never about the fame. It was about like making it A, right? Like to me, making it was like a thing, right? It was like, how do I make it? And I, don't, I never knew what the definition of making it was. I just knew I'd, f I'd feel it when I got there, you know? And, and, and two was, how do I entertain as many people as possible? So when I graduated college, I always worked in food throughout high school. I worked at River Forest Market on Lake Street for the really mean butchers with mustaches, with stacks of Playboys in the back and sawdust on the floor. I had to clean sawdust stuff off the floor. Again, aging myself. I'm not even 40 yet. And you're already like, where's like the apron and the handlebar mustache? <laughs> Unironic handlebar mustache. And they chain smoke while cutting meat. It was awesome, and I hated every minute of it. Um, and then I got a job. That was for three, $3.62 an hour. That is a fact. I'll never forget that. And I got my first paycheck. It was like $22. And then I, I moved on down uh, uh, a little bit west to traveling fair, and I worked uh, as, you know, in the sandwich shop there and as catering and stuff. So from that point on, I pretty much always worked at food from Taste of Chicago during the summers, uh, you know, slanging beefs and toasted ravioli for Tuscany to whatever way I can. So I always had an affinity for that. So when I graduated college, I opened a deli with my cousin out in Westmont. But that same week we opened the deli, I got cast in Tony and Tina's wedding. Uh, yeah, I laughed too inside. Uh, no, but it really did prepare me from an improv standpoint how to work any room possible. I mean, we, had, you know, it was, it was six shows a week, so I'd work the deli full time and then go do shows Wednesday through Sunday, two on Saturday. Any funny memories from what was the most memorable oh. moment of your time with okay, Tony? Okay, so you have wedding? you have the chapels right next to the it was at Piper's Alley. Uh, if any, anybody, is anybody go to that? Anybody go to that when I was there? <laughs> I, well, I know my family's raised it <laughs> nine times. That's why I didn't make any money there. I had to get them comp tickets. Um, it was like the chapel, and then there was uh, the venue right there that helped 350 people. I mean, it was legit back then. And we do the chapel, and we went right into the venue, and I was playing Tony at the time, I think, and... Um, we're for, all people, dancing. for people who don't know, it's a, it's a, it's a wedding. It's, it's an, an interactive Italian-American wedding where you're the guest and we're the performers. And it's all improv. We have blocking. But at the end of the day, it's what we're saying mostly, 90% of the time, is just work in the room. Work in the table work, we call it. You know? But there is like a fight and there's, you know, there's a f crying. And then there's, you know, it's a whole thing. The, the, the priest gets obviously drunk. I mean, it's a whole thing. <laughs> Very uh, highbrow. The, probably the, 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 the most memorable part is right when we got into the, to the reception hall and we're all dancing and there's a live band playing. There's a guy dancing with one of the bridesmaids. She just pulls him. The guy drops, I swear to God, drops dead. Like has a heart attack. Probably 38 years old. So I know, I know. Just, no. So, so, but this was a lesson, right? And so our, our the, everybody's crying. I mean, I, t I tell you, the paramedics come in and they're... Don't, it got, I, I, I'm not laughing, 
But what happened, I mean, it was so dramatic, at least from what I recall, and it wasn't that long ago. I mean, it was literally like taking him out in a body bag. Like, that's what happened. And we're all sitting there, in the, in, and a lot, of, a lot of people are crying. A lot of we're back, some are backstage, some are there. The, half the audience leaves. I mean, they hightighted it. They're like, we, we did not sign up for this. And the other ones are like, we signed up for this. The half of them didn't believe that this really happened. So now we have to, like, even after the body bag, I mean, the guy's... You can't breathe in a body. I, mean, I don't know. I think they're pretty airtight. Uh, so, 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 so they. I, I mean, it was terrible. It, it was, and we're all backstage, and, and we're like, and the director comes in. He's like, you know, it's that old ad, adage, like, right? The show must go on. So, he's like, we've got about thirty percent retention rate out there. Do you, you know, you guys can all go home, but my recommendation is let's give these people a show. So. We went back out there, and the, the guy who played, this guy Marty Shannon, rest in peace, he, uh, he was the old priest. He was there for everyone, chain smoker, everything, and he's like smoking back. He's like, you know, he had this gruff voice. And I'll never forget, it was like the best timing ever, but he goes, I guess we knocked him dead. And that was it. In that moment, we all kind of giggled the rig, and we went back out there, and we put on a show. You know what I mean? And it was the weirdest night of my life, but... We had no choice, you know. The show must go on. You know what I mean? I, I don't know. I believe in that. I think there's some old, old-timey old show business, things like that, that should be adhered to. <laughs> How is that? Was that insensitive? I'm just telling stories. That was a great story. That was the greatest... I think that's the greatest single story... <laughs> ...that we've heard in the history of the Wednesday Journal Conversation. <laughs> Thank you. You mean Axelrod didn't have a knock him dead story with... I, not as I recall. Yeah, okay. How is your comedy? I mean, obviously, your, your, your comedic instincts helped you land the gig with mm-hmm. the Food Network. Yeah. But how has it, over the years, played out in other aspects of your career? Um, I don't know. I, was, I always thought I was funny. Like, I got voted at, at Roosevelt, eighth grade, which caused a fist fight, which I almost got expelled for. <laughs> I won Funniest Guy against another guy, right? And it was called Funniest Guy. So they had like the mock elections. <laughs> Here's another great story to share. Uh, so I had him. No, um, but it was it was a big deal, and I won it, and I believe I was the funniest guy. <laughs> the whole class did. The other kid was just a bully. Yeah. I won't mention his name. He could be listening. <laughs> and it led to this whole like thing. This whole play. There were sides, and there was fights, and the guy smashed a kid in the locker. I didn't. I was just reacting. I was defending myself. It doesn't matter. I went on to graduate from Oak Park River Forest. Now we're all friends, right? We're all a somewhat, t- you know, adults or whatever, teenagers. I win class clown at Oak Park River Forest High School. And everybody's like, whoa, boy, you're going to meet at the bike racks, you know, is it? It's going down at 315 at the bike racks. But, like, I always was, like, I loved a classroom, not for the learning aspect. I loved it for like how do I become like how how do I how am I how am I funny but still somewhat being respected by the teacher and not being sent to the principal's office. For me, it was like always like it's it was my it was my weapon. You know, it was my sport was being funny and like how do I and it started from being around our dinner table. I think where this is my own you know psychological examination of myself, but like how do, how did I get attention at the dinner table. You know, my older brother would make us all cry or like, you know, with his mean words. And I would, you know, but then I got to a point where I'm like, I'm not going to cry anymore. Whereas my younger, my two younger sisters would always cry. So they get attention from crying. So my brother's getting attention just by being yelled at. My sisters were being consoled. How do I get attention? I could be the levity, you know, and I can... And I was always like, it was like, go talk to your sister upstairs. She's crying. And I'd be like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it was ingrained in me in a long... So I don't know if it's much as, you know, nature versus nurture. I don't know. Was it ingrained in me or was it learned? I think I come from funny stock and, you know. Well, how has it, how has it affected your career, you know, in, in Hollywood? Or yeah. in California, anyway. Yeah. Or, and, you know, in the workplace, in the business community as you, you know, build this restaurant chain. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's my brand at this point. You know what I mean? People want to just, you know, like, not say like, hey, Jeff, make me laugh, but they expect a certain, you know, persona from me, whether I'm at the restaurant cooking or at a meet and greet or at a 
paid gig or something, you know? Uh, and it's kind of my angle. And I think it was when I was in Food Network Star, um, whatever, seven, eight years ago, and I finally made it onto that show after four tries, and I was casting the show, and I'm living in a house with 14 random people in California, like shooting a reality, like literally shooting me brush my teeth at night at like three in the morning. Uh, it was an odd thing, and I go, and I was like, I kind of had an epiphany. I go, I knew I could never be, you know, and I've spent years doing stand-up and improv and sketch comedy and stuff like that, and I was like, I knew I could never be the funniest comic in the world, and I could never, certainly after going to culinary school and working in all aspects of food, I was never going to be the best chef in the world, but I could be the funniest chef. Because <laughs> nobody's claiming that, right? And I don't know if they go hand in hand, but even when I was working in kitchens, I'd be like, hey, everybody. What do you want? You want, an Im- you, know, you want an imitation? What, what do you want? You know, so I think everywhere I've worked, whether it's an office, a restaurant, work from home, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to be funny, you know? And it's, I could fall flat a lot. I don't know. I, you who know, make, but. Who makes you laugh now? What comedians out there do you, who's work, I do enjoy do some of my lines on the kitchen at 10 a.m. on Saturday. Because <laughs> I do watch it like game film. I thank you. I really, sometimes I'm like, oh boy. And I'll be the first to like sit there and like be like, what's with your hair? With, why'd you choose that sweater? And why'd you say that? But man, I swear. When I, and then I'll look at my, like if my wife laughs, forget about it. I know it's funny. Because she's, she's my toughest critic, as is my mother who's there. My mom grew up telling me I wasn't funny many times. Because that's what wasn't funny. It wasn't funny. But it just made me want to be funnier. But who makes me laugh? Uh, who, you know, I'm a big Howard Stern fan, so all the, 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 those characters on that show make me laugh out loud constantly. Um, I don't know. Okay. Clearly, you're a fan of your own work, which is a wonderful thing. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> that sounds terrible, too. No. That's all you're going to, you're going to cut from this, the body bag story and me being like, I'm the funniest guy. We're, we're not, we're boom, not, boom. we're not cutting the body bag. No, story. we're not. The body that's, bag that's story a That's a true story. You could fact check that, Charlie. So 2011. Yeah. You're anointed the you winner in the yeah. Food Network contest. You moved to California, right? No, we moved, we were in California before that, like four years before that. Uh, six, six, seven years. So we moved... What happened was I left Tony and Tina's wedding, the deli sold, and then me and my, my wife, Sarah, who's a nurse, which for any, uh, you know, uh, uh, burgeoning performers out there, get yourself hooked up with the nurse. They can work anywhere and get paid for it pretty well. But we were engaged at the point. She's like, I'm going to, you know, she's like, what are we doing? I'm like, let's move to L.A. She can work from there, got a job in, K- in L.A., Glendale, and I was just kind of, I wasn't, I was working, I got a job too, but I was performing and everything, so after four years of trying to make it out in Hollywood, uh, doing pilots and getting representation and having plenty of meetings, it just didn't work out, and one day I rolled over about three years into it, and I was like, I'm going to go to culinary school. I go, if I'm, if I'm shooting these, like, homemade cooking show pilots, I'm going to have the credibility and the knowledge and that's what kind of I think that decision made me made me a candidate uh, eventually so by by the time we moved back home after four years in LA I was like I don't want to be here anymore we want to start a family want to have babies why did you come back here because I lived in LA and it wasn't normal you know and everybody was everybody was from I know that's cliche to say but everybody's from somewhere else everybody's chasing essentially the same dream, the same care, and everybody's nice to your face, but really cutthroat, and everybody's doing something but doing nothing, and I feel like here you can't really get by on, you know, uh, talking a big game. You got to survive, you got to pay rent, you know, there it's like their parents are paying their rent, and they're like performing, but they're not working, and they're, I, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't feel like I could, my soul wanted to be there. So I think things started, like the path was defined when I moved back home and my body and, and heart and soul were in Chicago and in this area and stuff. When you came back, what did you look for in a home? I mean, physically, what, yeah. what, the neighborhood, how did you decide where you were going to live here? Well, I think it's important to be around family first and foremost. 
especially if you have a young one, it's like free babysitting um, <laughs> for the most part. It's true, thank you. It's one. Uh, <laughs> But I wanted to be, I don't know, it's, it's funny. I know you're saying your, your kids, you're like, you're hope, you just hope they move back. You know, one's in Portland, one's in the city. It was off the record. Yeah, I stand on <laughs> top, you day. But you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I would see that. I hope my son moves back here one day. I think you just wanted a community. And you realize, especially even after living in the city for a couple years in a condo and, like, sharing a space with somebody, you want space yourself. And you want the old familiar places. And you want a yard. And you want family. And you want... And everybody, I mean, it's funny, when I moved back in August to River Forest, so many, so many people are like, it's just a matter of time, I feel like, you know, at least with the good ones. <laughs> a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Uh -oh. uh, this is from Deb Maroney. When did you know you were a true foodie, and what were some of your favorite foods growing up? Um... I don't know. I think growing up in a big Italian-American family, food was always the epicenter of everything, whether it's, you know, a celebration or, you know, a funeral. Like, you know, there's a graduation party, there's food oh. everywhere, right? There's a birthday, there's food everywhere, you know? You stub your toe on the coffee table, there's your, your aunt's bring over trays of eggplant. Like, hey, you got to have eggplant. So I want to be in your family. Yeah, I know. It is. Well, <laughs> we've always struggled with it, you know, too, as well. You know, we love food so much. It really is, like, how we celebrate. And I think, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 I remember, like, little things, right? Like, Friday nights when we can order pizza or whatever. Like, to me, it was like, I cannot wait. I can't wait to get that pizza. You know what I mean? And, like, oh, I can't wait to eat the pizza. Like, for me, even to this day, like, my day, like, I'll plan it around the meals, and I can't wait for that meal. And it, it goes the same for my son and my nephews and, and my siblings. Like, we cannot wait. It's not like, what do you wear? It's like, well, what are we going to eat? <laughs> and yet... <laughs> That's a good line. Remember that. I'm going to write that down on my... Charlie, can I borrow your notepad? He has no. a pen if you want. <laughs> you are, for those listening at home and not looking, remarkably thin. Okay. How do you do that? Uh, it's been a journey. I work out really hard. I did a brutal workout today, and I work, you know, I, again, I watched the shows on Saturday, in, in the, especially during the first several years of my journey, I was, you know, I was, it's, it's hard. There's so much coming at you. You're getting taken out to dinner. You're being celebrated and kind of courted by agents and producers, and then I show up at work, and I'm surrounded by food, and like, you just consume, and I was, for me, it was like the best ever. Even like working in, in restaurants and food service, like, this was like beyond because this wasn't like my own food or, or professional. Like this was like going out to, so you learn first of all, just kind of scale back on that and take it easy a little bit. And then as the years going on, I'm like, I don't, I don't, and I got to like have wardrobe fittings all the time, like every three weeks. Jessie was just over yesterday. She's my wardrobe stylist and she puts me in clothes and I spent years being like, they don't make it in that size, but I want to wear it. It makes me, you know, and it's like, I was like, I wasn't happy. And then I watched the show and I wasn't happy how I looked. And as, as crazy as that sounds, it was, it's how I felt, you know? And I wasn't, I was like, how do I not only be, you know, healthy for, from an aesthetic stand -up, you know, point of view and knowing that I'm on television, I want to look my best, but I also want to feel my best. And with all the travel and eat, like I had to, you know, so I, I, I eat less and I work out more. I guess that's it. <laughs> I still eat like, I mean, I swear, man, I will eat. I ate today at Elle's on Madison Street, the Elle's Grill. Dude. All right, I, gotta, I have to I write that to one down. down. Elle's Grill, it's very good. I mean, have you had it? <laughs> Try this out. It's very unique. It's a Greek-run breakfast joint. <laughs> but I, it's very good. It's very good. I got an omelet with half American cheese, half Swiss cheese. Because the American cheese is creamy. The Swiss has got some bite to it, right? A little chew. Pickle jalapenos and ham. Side of uh, uh, breakfast sausage. Links, not patties. Two slices of rye toast with really salty uh, butter. And if it's not salty enough butter, I put salt on it. Uh, hash browns, extra crispy. And then half of my wife's food. <laughs> right? And a Diet Coke. <laughs> That's all fact. You can look at my receipt. I'm sure his name is George. Ask him. It's got to be George. I, uh, earlier today, I tweeted you a picture of my lunch. I, I didn't even saw it. it. You didn't see so it. You've been a busy guy. But here's what it was. It was a slice of, of, of wheat bread, cut in half, 
two pieces of uh, applewood smoked turkey. I don't mm. even know what that means. It's probably Applegate, right? Probably. Yeah. And uh, five uh, uh, sandwich uh, pickle slices. That's it. Where did you That's put it. the ketchup on this one? I didn't put ketchup on it. <laughs> What did, what did I do wrong, and how could I have done oh, better? Oh, whatever, man. You know what? Listen, I'm not going like, to sit there and like, judge you for your choices. You, you already have. I already okay. did with the, the ketchup, it. but that's like a cultural choice. Like, you chose to put ketchup on your stuff. Not today. Like, that's what you did. But you, <laughs> you, like, you, like, you like simplicity. I don't like overstuffed sandwiches. I don't think, you know, I don't like too many things. My father was there. We'll put everything on a sandwich. Talk about slippage. I mean, you can't. We got, we had bruises as kids just from him taking bites of food and right in the head. I mean, his ice cream creations alone. My dad would make us milkshakes. What, what's a milkshake, right? Milk, ice cream, a chocolate syrup, everything. To, you know, honey bunches of oats, trail mix, a half a loaf of Casa Nostra bread. Peanut butter, a banana, ice, right? You used to put like ice in it. I was like, you're killing it with the ice, Dad. And it would like, you know how like milkshakes, they, they start melting really quick. These, these would, there's so much like bread, like wheat product in there. It would stay, it was like stasis. It wouldn't, it was like a, it was like a, 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 a you know, a, whatever, a, 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 the ice thing. You could fill a pothole. with a glacier. It wouldn't move. <laughs> you could fill a pothole there. with it. It was so do pothole repair with this. It was. You, you, you could recalk your, your whole bathroom with it. It was, was good, it, though. Was it good, though? Of course it was good. <laughs> when, you, when you almost choke on a milkshake. <laughs> uh, this one's from Scott Frankel. Do you cook at home? Mm -hmm. And if so, what kind of meals do you prepare for your family? And I assume it's not a milkshake like the one you No, no, described. no. We, uh, I cook, we, we, try, we try four days a week. We usually make it to Thursday, try Sunday, Monday. When, if I'm not on the road, which is frequent, but I've been home for a couple weeks. So we've been cooking a lot. But um, uh, I, I usually, you know, we usually do a, a protein and then, you know, a big salad and a vegetable and like a sweet potato or a potato of some sort. You know, I love ribeyes. I love making steaks, cast iron skillet, ton of butter, right? Baste it in the butter and the aromatics in the, in the, see I'm doing that. That's like terrible. And yet you're skinny. Because I'm, listen, so I have a philosophy and I'll be honest with you. This is my diet. If you want to know, um, I, 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 I stop eating at seven o'clock. All right. If I'm out, if I'm, it's the weekends are fair game. And then I, I won't start eating again until at least maybe 1 o'clock the next day. So I'll wake up. I'll have a very hard workout. I'll drink black coffee and a ton of water, sometimes a couple pinches of Himalayan pink sea salt. It's weird, right? But for me, it works because why? For me, it's a psychological game, right? It's, I can't wait to eat later. And I love eating so much that for me, like, I spent my whole entire life planning my meals and revolving. It's like there's no better way to revolve your life around food than being like, and I've trained myself to the point where I'm not really that hungry. You know, I'm not like starving. My stomach, you know, if I'm like looking at pictures of food, you know, alone in my room, uh, <laughs> sold out, <laughs> my stomach will growl, you know? And something like today, I, I went right to L's because I had a very hard workout. And so, but even at that point, I still, did, I still stopped eating at seven and I made it to one o'clock or 12 o'clock or whatever. And there's science behind it and everything. Look it up. It's called intermittent fasting. I've been doing it a year. I'm down, you know, these are size 34 pants. I mean, I haven't worn 34. I, my eighth grade graduation, 42s. <laughs> Husky section. There were three pants in the entire, entire Cook County, and we got the, one of the last ones. Bugle boys. 26 inseam, 42 waist. You're selling... Giant coat. Giant double-breasted. From herbs. <laughs> it's true, though. I'm <laughs> Old retail mm -hmm. tailor. Your Pork and Mindy's restaurants yeah. are serving pork candy? Pig candy, Pig yes. Pig candy. It's, what it's, is it? Did, you, did everybody get some? Yeah. There's some samples for people right in the now. audience. But. They are sweet and are sweet heat. I don't know. It's just like a labor of love. It's a retail product uh, that uh, was kind of... You know, part of our DNA at the restaurants that we've, you know, um, learned to, you know, mass produce and, and give it to the masses. To me, it's 
It's better than jerky. It's literally just bacon and sugar. I mean, there's a couple of two ingredients on there. And it's, whereas jerky, you know, I love jerky and I love, you know, Jack Link's kippered beefsteak and Slim Jims and stuff like that, but you don't know what you're eating half the time. At least this, you know what you're eating and it's a good snack, comes with three, three you sticks, you know, three slices it's, of bacon. It's a good snack? In what sense is it a good snack? It's good. If you're tired, you have three sticks of pig candy, you're going to be less tired. <laughs> That's, I think that's on the package. <laughs> that's the slogan. Uh, no, I don't, you know what it's like, it's all about getting it out there, you know, and like growing this business to the sauces and the pig candy and the meats and everything. You know, I didn't open the restaurant to, like, I don't know, man. I could, I'm as good, you know, you're on TV, you're as good as your next pickup. And luckily with the kitchen, it's been so successful. We're scheduled for usually a year out just because it's hard to get four people together and it's hard to, you know, work around everybody's schedules, but I like to feel it's a successful show. But then again, I've had a couple shows canceled before, and it's a scary thing, because it's like, what do I do? I can't just put a show on TV. You know what I mean? Like, you're, it's up to the network. It's up to really powerful, high-paid people to green light things. And as much as I schmooze, and as I like to think I'm good at my job, I have very little control over it. So this, at least I have some control over my future in a way, and to kind of build a brand that's indicative of, of what I do on TV, you know, without being, you know, without trying to elevate, you know, I'm not like doing tweezer food and foams and stuff like that. It was, I didn't want to open up a full service restaurant, you know, and then deal with like the reservations from family members wanting <laughs> God knows how many reservations. So this way, you know, it's come, you know, fast casual, come with the family whenever you want, it's open for business. Let's go from pig candy to the other end of the nutritional spectrum. Veggie burgers are a, are a rising thing. What do yeah. you? I just had one. On for, I had one of the, um, not the Impossible Burger. What's the other one? The, um, the other bloody one. Uh, Beyond Meat. Beyond Meat. Beyond yeah. Meat. Yeah. They I've, sell I've at had, Whole Foods, I've right? In the in the. I've cryo had a couple van. of those recently. They're not bad. To me, they taste it's very similar to like a Morning Star burger or whatever, but they're just like red, um, and look like bloody meat. Which I dig. I think it was good. I think whatever, man. Listen, I'm not going to like say like, I'm not going st- to, I love, I like meat too much to stop. I understand the ethical reasons to stop eating meat, but it's, you know, it's so good. <laughs> see the smell, but right? But you don't, you when don't beef, see. Beef, like ground beef in a pan. Yeah. And it, like you could smell, like when you know someone's grilling burgers three doors down. And you gotta be on me, uh. but you don't see a business opportunity here for for you. No, I would in, totally in, in, do it. Like I would love to get a hand, you know, a hold of that, and because I know they got sausage and stuff, and smoke it. You know, everything in pork and is all our proteins are smoked in some capacity. So I'd be fun to play with. I think it's ultimately better for the environment, better for the world, um, obviously more sustainable and all that. And you know, it was good. It was an enjoyable thing. But I did have on the side of my Beyond Me was about three other. Ground Chuck burgers. <laughs> Just in case. I didn't know what I was getting into, so I had some backup. Guess what got eaten first. Okay, since, since you've lifted the curtain on some of our pre-show conversations, I want to lift the curtain here a little bit, too, because I try not to talk too much to the inter- interviewees before we, we do this. Yeah. But, um, but when you and I talked a few days ago, you told me you don't like to talk politics. Yeah. So I'm not going to ask you to talk politics, but I am going to ask you to talk about why you don't like to talk about politics. I don't know. I mean, you know what? I, I, I equate it to the reason why, if anybody saw SNL this last week, they cut out a political cold open for the first time since Trump was elected, which I think was the best move they made. They made it about the mothers, and they made it about comedy and things we could forget about. For me, it's like it's so, we're so inundated with it, and I don't want to polarize myself or anybody. I'm... I'm still so nervous that someone's going to take this job away from me. You know what I mean? Like, I fought tooth and nail for this. I put myself, my family, in weird situations, countless weird situations, whether it's moving across country, whether it's, like, you know, performing after a guy dies, you know, stuff like that. Like, I don't want to lose it. I love it so much. I don't, and, and, and I don't want to, like, alienate any of my fans, which, let's, let's face it, I'm on Food Network. I'm not on HBO. I'm not... You know, uh, uh, I can't really articulate, you know, or articulately speak to politics that well. I'm not that well read. You know, 
I am. Like, I read every night. I read a lot, but I just don't read, you know, p political t t literature, whatever <laughs> they call it, you kids. <laughs> whatever you kids call it. And so I'm not going to pretend like I know what I'm talking about. I don't want anybody, I don't think anybody really wants to hear what I think. And for that reason, I'm going to keep my mouth shut, keep cooking and being funny. And I think, I don't know, a lot of people can... And there's obviously a large place in this world for political satire, and I think it's very important for us to, uh, to be able to speak whatever we want, but personally, I'm good. Like, I'm good. And I'd rather see stupid sketches on SNL, because we all need an escape, and I hope to be an escape from people, not remind people whatever the hell's going on. Does this political environment change the restaurant business in any way? I mean, the conversation. Yeah, I think. I mean, you see what happened to so many chefs, you know, and and food people, whether they're celebrity chefs or just restaurant tours or uh, restaurant chefs, you know. And you know, you see it. I've seen it. I can guarantee. On my swear on my son, I've never been a part of it. I've been with my wife for since. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary. She's like, ah, no. But honest to God, like, I'm, I'm, I pride myself. I've, I've been with my wife since we were 21 years old. I'm now 39. I knew her for four years before that. I've, you know, I've never been, I think I was raised, you know, to respect women. I come from a big family of strong women. And, right? Do you, do you agree with that, Emily? <laughs> yeah, like a creepy dude. Totally not a creepy dude. Like, you know? <laughs> A, an ass pincher, a tickler, none of that stuff. There's no children. I could say ass pincher. We don't know who's listening to the podcast. That's but, the name uh, of, that was the name of my high school band, by the way, ass pincher. <laughs> All right, well, that brings us to our next subject, oh, no. because I know that beyond food, you have a, a fascination, a, an interest in pop culture yeah. of all sorts. It's very true. So what are, your, what are your favorite cultures of the popular sort? I love TV, of course. I love television. <laughs> I don't, Thank you. A, because I liked it before I was on TV. And the worst thing you could say to me, right, is like, I don't have cable. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like you go up to an accountant and you're like, I don't file my taxes. You know what I mean? It's like, how dare you? You're taking away from my son's, my food from my son's mouth. You realize by when you cut the cord, you cut the direct conduit to my thing. I, I got cable. Okay, good. Cool. Thank God. That would have been two, two major strikes with the catch-up, not the <laughs> cable. I only cable. want one. That's a... No, but obviously, we, you don't need cable these days. But for me, it's like, I love my whole family. We love television. That's what we have our conversation. It's like, have 50 food, 50, what'd you eat last night, and what'd you watch last night, right? <laughs> and I love television. I mean, everything from majority of HBO programming, you know, you name it, I watch it, you know, Game of Thrones, all that, to like... Vanderpump rules. I don't care. I am. I can bench 245 pounds three times. I watch these trashy reality shows about housewives. I like it. It's escapism, and it makes me feel really good about my family situation, <laughs> which can be a show unto itself. And one of the things that you do with your family, I understand, is make music. Yes. So, yeah, we, we've all, we grew up in a musical household. You know, we took piano lessons as a kid. My brother continued on with piano. He's very good. We sing. I play guitar. I used to take, I took my first guitar lessons in eighth grade, which was Wallace Music on North Avenue. Remember that? Some guy, chain smoker with a mustache. It's probably this close to getting an invite to his windowless van. <laughs> it's not like School of Rock right now, right? School of Rock is where my son goes. It's amazing... School, but I, who knows what could have happened. I made it out of there alive. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then from there, I went to Guitar Fund for several years, remember, right on, on Lake in Ridgeland. Um, and I loved it. Like, for me, it was just, you know, we had a, a, you know, a baby grand piano, and when we'd have family parties or holidays, we'd gather around the piano. You know, if this wasn't like the, you know, Milk Toast Von Tramp stuff. I mean, we were playing some <laughs> dirty stuff. We were getting down and dirty most of the time, you know. And Marvin you Gaye and, like, let's get it on as a family. It's always weird to hear at a, you know, a funeral luncheon, but we did it. And Which is probably pretty, I'm sure we played let's get it on at a funeral luncheon before. <laughs> What's that? We've done that at, like, four weddings. Four weddings, we've done it, yeah. So we're, we, you know, we were music. And listen, our biggest hang-up is that we can... <sighs> 
I really wish if I could, I don't know, I don't know if you know, go back in time, but go way back in time and like change our genetic makeup. I wish we could all harmonize vocally together. That's our biggest hang up. We really can't. We're terrible at it. Emily will say that. Frank is, my brother can't. Us oh, horrible at trying to harmonize. But you and your son, Lorenzo. We have a band, yeah. Do you harmonize? No, he can't. Well, he's not saying yet. I'm hopefully, hopefully my wife has some kind of dormant harmonization gene in her <laughs> that will come through in my nine-year-old boy. And I, I don't want to crack the whip with it. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like there's like the football dad mentality where you're like, oh, you know, boom, you know. For me, it's like, I, I just want it to organ. I want him to enjoy, perf- you know, playing with his old man. Music. You've got a great band name, though. Yeah, we're called Tomorrow. <laughs> uh, be. We play. He plays drums. I play guitar. Um, he's still not good enough for me, I don't think. I got his kids. Got, I'm kidding. No, he's 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 really. It's it's amazing. Again, this with the school of rock, te- you know, teaches these kids. It's great, and we'll play. You know, we play holidays, and then my sister comes up plays. And I have keyboards. When we moved in August to to a house, I I, I had a prerequisite. You know, the kitchen's fine. I can cook in any kitchen. I really can. And we're fortunate enough to move into a new house. And so the kitchen was, everything was already built. We just moved into it. And the kitchen was already spectacular. And we, the, our kitchen in Elmwood Park was very small. Uh, our backyard was fine. Like, I know all that would come with a house from River Forest, space and everything. I just wanted two things. I wanted a jam room in the basement to put all my instruments where the family can gather. My brother could play keyboards. I have amps, PAs. And I made that happen, right? I mean, I have a PA that is 83 times larger than the PA right here. 83? You did that calculation I did. I saw that. And I did. I did a, that did was a thing. There was a, a, a you know, the, that thing. Yeah. 90 degree thing. Yeah. Compass. I'm impressed. Right? A logarithms. So you've got an 83. Uh, uh, it's it's loud in there, right? It's loud. Yeah. It's, it's great. So we did that. And the second thing, I was just a bathtub, man, that I could fit into. <laughs> I, I, my, I love bathing. That's my other sport. I am a, <laughs> the best bather in this room, I guarantee you. I will put up, I, I, am, I bring my Kindle in there, and I read. Okay, but not an electric guitar. No, I do that not. Would be bad. That would not be bad. <laughs> that would not be good. It would be bad. Regardless, I go in there, and my old bathtub in, um, in Elmwood Park was a very, what you would think, you know, the curtain and the thing, a very small tub. And, and I wouldn't, it wouldn't even get above my chest, right? Or my, it wouldn't even breach the areola zone. So I'd be in this tiny bath, and I'd have to like buy, I'd buy, I'd buy a plug. Areola, it's a scientific That's word, Charlie. Look it up, bro. I'm completely comfortable with it. I'm just I'm admi- very right I'm right admiring now. Your, your comfort level. Axelrod never said areola. No, he didn't. Yeah, that. <laughs> So I had to buy a plug for $3.99 on Amazon for the overflow valve so it would fill up more, but then it's a dangerous situation. So I, I would say I would otter myself. So it would just splash water on my chest of here to get, because I'd be just so, you know, goosebumpy and so cold. And then I'd, you know, I'd, con- I'd regulate the thing. You know what I mean? A little hot. A little warm, shut it down, the, getting overflow. For the podcast audience, Jeff is I'm using his foot, foot to yes. control the... Yeah, yeah. I use my... my it's it's like, your foot, though, right? Uh, you like, do uh, use like a foot. A, like a Correct. lemur's tail. <laughs> <laughs> like this, right? Precision. The foot. Blindfold. The but foot. then it wasn't enough, right? Because it still never got above me. So I, I'd have to, like, turn and, like, soak this half. Wait, you lost your microphone. So, sorry. So I have to turn and soak this half and then make a thing and soak this half and occasionally I get very adventurous and go dump me down <laughs> like this which is a sight to walk into when you're my wife and I'm literally like so this is the old bathtub that was the old bathtub now it's too much room <laughs> now it's like you know the, like uh, you know uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure Francis's bathtub you need a lifeguard I do need a lifeguard. Yeah, get you a lifeguard. <laughs> I do. My wife's there with the whistle on the high chair. <laughs> All right, so... <laughs> Amazingly, we're out of time. Oh, no. <laughs> but that was exactly the right reaction. Thank you for that. Before we wrap it up, I want to give you a chance to combine a couple of your passions. Okay. 
improv, yeah. and music. Yeah. So we have a little surprise. Jeff has brought his guitar oh with him. Oh, boy. Yeah. yeah, you want me to grab it? Go get your guitar. All right. Uh, all right, I don't know how this is going to go, but I'll tell you what. I... So I do, we do have a band, I like to say, on, on set of the kitchen. And if everybody, anybody ever finds themselves in New Jersey, you know, whatever, contact me through social media. You can be part of the live audience. It's really fun. You get to eat our food and everything. It's a really unique experience. We shoot in Montclair, New Jersey, which I just read last night was the neighborhood of Montclair was named after Montclair, New Jersey. Why are you laughing? It's true. And we have a little band there, you know, and so I play with sound guys who are like, you know, savants almost. Like, they're so gifted, and they know everything. They can harmonize like nothing. It's like a dream come true, finally. Um, so we get to play, whereas most of the, you know, my cast members, God love them, you know, where, where I have the little room with instruments and stuff to go to and play, you know, you know, I, I just, I felt like the first couple runs we had at the kitchen back in the day, it's like, you shoot, we shoot 12 acts a day. In between the acts, like you sit there and you're just looking at your phone. You know, it's like, what, do you, you know, looking at an Insta, I don't know, it's like worthless. I was like, I'm, then I'd be tired to go do another act and then a subsequent, another whatever, 10 acts. So, you know, I brought a guitar out there and then other people brought instruments. So that's like kind of my thing. So we get, we wrap an act, I go and I play music for 15 minutes, go back and do that 12 times. Of course, you know, 12 times a day through three you know, three days in a row. So it's, it's become kind of my, I don't know, way to keep sharp, you know, not get like bogged not down. Not flat. Not flat. Hey. <laughs> so, so that being said, what I like to do on, on set a lot is make up songs, you know. Um, funny story. I'll, I'll, I'll play this song, really, if you don't mind. Uh, literally, we shoot right along, I like to call it the Mighty Montclair River, which is, you know, like a dirty tire-filled stream. Um, which runs along the back of our set. And if you've seen the kitchen, we really do shoot outside. Right behind where we shoot is this stream. So one of the guys, one of the art director guys, was putting up a thing, and he fell through a sinkhole like, and caught himself with his elbows. And he almost went down into the dirty, Mon muddy Montclair. And so we're all sitting, everybody, he's bleeding. And, you know, of course me. <laughs> so we're all sitting there like, do you hear about Justin? He's, dude, he went in a sinkhole. Which happened again the next two runs later. He felt the same guy fell in the same sinkhole. Just like I was like, dude, what are the odds? I'm like, go, go to the boat. You know, let's, by the boat, mean the gambling boat. Like you should be gambling because you're either the most luckiest or unluckiest person. But so uh, you know, me and my crew, we. Uh, so I wrote this song. So so we, you know, we're there, and I don't want to make light of it, but I, I you know wanted to make light of it. Yeah, make light of it. <laughs> Love's like a sinkhole, I'm falling in deep Surrounded by soil and crushed brown leaves I hear the wind blows calling my name Love's like a sinkhole, I'm drowning again Sound guys harmonize so nice, me. You're late. Looks like a sinkhole, I'm falling in deep. And then there was another guy, right? And he was standing there. And he was, his name's Mark. He's a really cool guy, super hipster, collects vinyl. He's got a really long beard, right? You know, so, so then I'm sitting there and I see him, and I'm like, this guy loves. Stroking my beard Stroking my beard Stroking my beard And I'm falling in love with you It's all gotta be a love song Stroking my beard Right there Stroking my beard Stroking my beard And I'm falling in love with you It's all saved up I'm gonna spend it on a big black truck I'm stroking hard I'm stroking long Come on baby, see what we can do wrong And 
have stroke in my beard, right? I want, I, want to, I want to see you combine your ad-lib abilities with your musical abilities. So I thought we'd take from the audience okay. a recommendation. You can pick which one. A food. Bacon. Okay. Bacon and uh, a location. City Hall. What's that? City Hall? <laughs> Taylor Street. Taylor Street. Oh, hey. <laughs> Bacon, Taylor Street. How about like a like a vibe, you know, like a musical blues. A persuade blues. blues. Okay, that I can okay. do. Okay, bacon, so ba blues. So the Taylor Street. <laughs> I'm driving down the Eisenhower, <laughs> going six. <laughs> don't wanna get pulled over. Don't wanna fall into trick. Then I get off Everything <laughs> I stop into the white hands And by myself A bacon dream <laughs> Oh, Taylor Street Bacon Italian flair to that pork mule. The only thing that bacon goes better on in a sandwich is a plate of carbonara. Who's that's the green? And that's the way it sounded. Food Network star Jeff Morrow on stage at Dominican University, May 15th, 2018. I'm Charlie Meyerson. You're listening to Chicago Public Square.